The Explorers Club. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone for joining us and thank you very much uh, to Chris. It's a real pleasure to have you on the Explorers Club. It was um, an event that caused a lot of excitement. We've got a lot of people joining us from all over the world. I've had so many messages about it. So I really appreciate you taking time out to come along and do the Explorers Club with us. That's fine. No problem. Uh, I've done the mowing. So, <laughs> you know, I'm free. That's good, because it was no Mo May, so you left it for the whole of June and just started in July. That's good going. Oh, do you know, I, did, I, I didn't even know it was no Mo May. Uh, I should have done, but actually, um, just by dint of laziness, I have been leaving it for a very long time. So it was kind of getting towards being a nice meadow, but it's oh, not my lawn. I'm staying with my dad meadows. and he, he was getting fed up with it. So I had to do it today. I have like a family legend that before I was born, my mum and dad bought me a tortoise, but my dad let the grass grow for so long that just before I was born, he went over it with a lawnmower and chopped it up. Oh no. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true or whether that's just an urban Jane's family legend now, but I think, well, I think it was true. I went over a tree stump today and the mower did not like that. Um, yeah. That's, that sounds like that could potentially be quite dangerous as well. Maybe. I want one of those little robot. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think we've got, we've got 33 people in. I think we had something like 43 people booked, but we'll get started. And then um, if anyone extra comes along, I'll just let them in and I'll keep an eye on the doorbell situation. Okay, Chris. So I'll hand yeah. it to you now. Okay, great. Um, well, um, Sarah, thank you so much for the invite. Um, it is very nice to be part of the Explorers Club. Um, uh, coming not live to you from St. Leonard's, uh, but the Explorers Club is based in St. Leonard's, right, which is a very beautiful place on the uh, and the sea in the south coast. Um, and uh, I'm going to close the chat. I have been looking at the chat and it's lovely to see so many people in lots of different places, some familiar faces as well, familiar names, I should say. Which is lovely. Um, so, um, yeah, so thanks, Sarah, um, for the invite and thanks, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Imhotep today. Um, and I've always thought that Imhotep was a very interesting subject because he's, kind, he's almost had kind of three lives, Imhotep. He had a, he had a real, real life on Earth. Uh, as we will see um, in the uh, Egyptian Old Kingdom. Then he had a kind of uh, a long uh, afterlife um, as a folk hero and, and then as a god. Um, and he kind of had a, a sort of renaissance thanks to Hollywood as, um, as the bad guy of a series of mummy films. Um, so we're gonna have a look at, um, at all the ways in which uh, he, he's had a, a life of sorts and um, why his name is so recognisable and well known to us. And um, in the second half of the talk, we're going, to, uh, we're going to be looking at where he might have been buried and what the chances are that we might yet actually find the real life tomb of this real life person. Uh, so to begin with, um, I'm going to finish up with the Egyptology side of things, which is the, the stuff that I really ought to be um, a bit stronger on. But to begin with, I thought I'd just delve into um, the, the sort of third of those lives, if you like, um, his, his Hollywood life. Because um, actually that, that is probably uh, what's meant that for many people today, the name at least, Imhotep, um, is well known. And there have been several versions of the mummy film, some of them featuring um, a mummy character, mummy bad guy called him Hotep. Others, uh, in other cases, the mummies had a different name. Um, but the, the classic film, The Mummy, the, the original, is the 1932 
uh, movie directed by Carl Freund and starring Boris Karloff um, in the lead role, and we see him here as Imhotep um, slash Ardath Bey, which is a name the character takes on in a, in a more sort of modern incarnation. Um, just as a, a, a tangent straight away, um, those of you who uh, have heard me speak before will know I'm, uh, I love a tangent. I love to go rambling on. Um, I try to curb this as far as I can, but this is a quite a good one, I think. The, um, the inspiration for the appearance of Boris, Boris Karloff's uh, mummy is the real life mummy of Ramesses III, um, which you see here. It's one of the ones that was discovered in the Royal Cache at Der um, by and by Abdel Rasul brothers, sometime probably in the 1870s. We don't exactly know when they first came across it. Um, they became known to the Egyptian uh, authorities and the, um, the world of archaeology at the beginning of the 1880s and, and those mummies were unwrapped and they're now on display in the Egyptian Museum and this is one of I think the most haunting so as you can see here you know he sort of has the appearance of somebody with eyes closed a mouth sort of slightly downturned at the corners which gives him a, depending on how you feel about these things a slightly sinister appearance anyway a certainly a very good model uh, for uh, the Karloff mummy the film opens with um, some brief text, including uh, this, which appears on the screen very briefly at the start of the movie. It says, O oh, Amun Ra, O oh God of Gods, death is but the doorway to the new life. We live today, we shall live again. In many forms shall we return, O oh, Mighty One. And that sort of sets us up for this idea of the coming back to life of the, the mummy of the film. And so the film begins, uh, the, 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 the setting for the beginning of the movie is an archaeological expedition. Um, we're told uh, an expedition of the British Museum. Uh, and um, they have been very successful, it seems. They're, we find them in their workroom, um, laboring away, copying inscriptions or reading texts or something like that, making notes and discussing things. Um, in the background, you see an anthropoid human shaped coffin standing up against the wall lid off with a mummy in this position sort of um, you know leaning up inside as if they just sort of stood it on one side um, not how you treat uh, mummies and coffins on archaeological projects today but but there are photos of such things from the 19th century and perhaps early 20th as well so maybe this wasn't such an uncommon scene they're discussing the discovery of a casket they tell us um, which is apparently sealed and they think is terribly important. And there's an inscription on the outside that suggests to one member of the team that this casket really must not be opened because something terrible might happen uh, if, uh, if they do. Um, and of course, uh, you know what happens. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't then leave it and never open it. Of course, within a matter of seconds in the film, one of the other team members has opened uh, the casket and begins reading the text uh, from the Book of Thoth, which is, turns out to be inside the so-called Book of Thoth. And as he's reading this, behind him, our mummy begins to come to life, um, of course. Uh, and not very long later, we don't actually see what happens. All we see is, uh, is our, uh, our archaeologist um, suddenly setting eyes on, uh, we don't see him, but it must be the mummy waking up. And he, he sort of screams in terror and then starts laughing maniacally and we later find out that he he died of madness um, meanwhile the mummy leaves taking the book of thoth with him exactly as you'd expect from a from a film like this and um, shortly after this in the film the film then skips forward about 10 years to the early 1930s um present day uh, as it would have been when the film came out um uh, and the british museum expedition is still going on but um it's led by uh, the sort of next generation of archaeologists by this point. And this figure, mysterious figure, turns up halfway through the project, um, walking very slowly and deliberately and speaking with a very low voice and very slowly and deliberately uh, and calling himself Ardath Bay. Um, and he has a message for the team, which is that he knows exactly where they should dig if they want to find something exciting. Um, and perhaps sensing that there's something about this chap um, is it the wizened flesh? Is it the strange name? Is it the strange uh, way of speaking? Anyway, they trust him and they, they follow him and he shows them where they should dig. And hey presto, not long afterwards, they find the tomb of a princess. So Ardath Bay knew what he was talking about. How could this be, uh, you ask? Well, perhaps you're already uh, coming to the same conclusion as the audience would have at the same time, which is that this Ardath Bay chap looks rather, rather familiar. 
uh, to us. Indeed, um, he is uh, the revivified Imhotep, who we saw at the beginning of the movie in mummified form, um, come back to life, adopted modern dress and a modern a sort of modern name. Um, and later on in the film, we find out wh what his uh, story is. And it turns out that this poor love in ancient times uh, had fallen in love with somebody called, um, in the film, the name is pronounced something like Angsen Armen, uh, which is not a zillion miles away from the, uh, the very good, well-attested name Angsen Amun. Um, we don't really know how ancient Egyptian names were pronounced, so Angsen Armen is probably a pretty good um, attempt at it. The, the name Angsen Amun is the name that was um, given to the wife of Tutankhamun, incidentally. Tutankhamun of the 18th dynasty, uh, Im, R. Imhotep of the third dynasty. So the names are in, in real terms separated by many centuries, but here they are nonetheless, Imhotep and Angsen Amun uh, in love with one another. And unfortunately, Angsen Amun uh, has passed away and Imhotep is terribly unhappy about this. As you can imagine, you can see here from his expression, he's very sad about this. He's wearing, um, incidentally, a, this close fitting cap here, which is, um, as we'll see from the real iconography of real Imhotep, actually quite uh, good, quite accurate. Somebody's done their homework here. Anyway, he's terribly unhappy because his beloved Angsen Armin has passed away. But he realises that there is such a thing as the Book of Thoth, which is hidden away in a temple in a sort of secret uh, door in the base of a statue, in fact. And um, if he can just get this Book of Thoth, then he knows that it, it, it's um, uh, inscribed with some magic incantations. And if he reads this out, then he'll be able to bring Aung San Armin uh, back to life. And, and who wouldn't want to do that? So he steals the Book of Thoth, uh, quite frankly, um, and um, is about to bring Aung San Armin back to life, but then uh, is apprehended by the authorities who are not happy about this because um, the great power of the Book of Thoth is not intended to be used willy-nilly by people whose girlfriends have died. Um, so they decide that he's going to have to be punished, this guy. So uh, what they do is they decide that he's going to be mummified alive and buried with the Book of Thoth so that um, the Book of Thoth will never ever uh, be used again. Of course, we all know that anything that gets buried with people in ancient Egypt um, never sees the light of day ever again. Um, I'm being sarcastic, of course. Um, if you bury things with, the, with dead people in ancient Egypt, we know very well that the likelihood it is that they'll be robbed um, very quickly, um, if not eventually found by archaeologists. Anyway, um, it's the latter, in fact, that, that of course happens. Um, so Imhotep is buried with the Book of Thoth. He doesn't manage to, to bring his Angsen Armin back to life. And, and so there he stays, having been uh, mummified alive until he's discovered by the British Museum expedition a long time later. Um, skip to the end of the film. What, he, what, of course, he wants to do thousands of years later, uh, having uh, stolen the Book of Thoth from the archaeologists and, and wandered off and assumed this new identity, Ardath Bay, um, is he wants still to bring Aung San Armin back to life. And in fact, um, when he visited the, the archaeologist to say, you really ought to dig here, he was pointing them towards the tomb of his beloved Aung San Armin. So they dig up her mummy. Um, and um, eventually she, he visits the Egyptian museum where her mummy is um, to be found. Um, and in the meantime, this is, a, this is a slight sort of complication in the plot. It turns out that Aung San Armin has sort of been reincarnated um, as a young English lady uh, in a, a sort of member of high society in Cairo. Um, and here she is, and she's called Helen Grosvenor. Her character is called Helen Grosvenor. Um, and she has an Egyptian mother, British father, but Egyptian mother. So she seems to have been the reincarnation of Aung San Armin. Anyway, she, she ends up being dragged off to the museum as well um, and falls under the spell of Imhotep who then says, well, this is great because um, here we are. Uh, all we need to do now is live happily uh, together in eternity. And I've got the Book of Thoth, so uh, that shouldn't be any problem. The only thing is I'm going to have to kill you uh, and then mummify you and then bring you back to life. Is that okay? And understandably, as you can see from this sh screenshot, she's not terribly happy with this arrangement. She's quite happy just remaining alive uh, in the real world. Um, and um, at this point, oh, the door's just open, sorry. At this point, this spookily, uh, the door in my room here is just blown open. 
what's going on? Um, it can only be mummy magic. Uh, so uh, what happens is the archaeologists turned up at this point and they, they intercede. They stop Imhotep from, uh, from, from murdering Helen Grosvenor in order that he can magically bring her back to life. And um, uh, instead they read out something else and he, he, he it becomes re-mummified and crumbles to dust and that's the end of the film. So uh, that's a very uh, quick sort of whistle-stop tour through the, the story of the Hollywood Imhotep's um, life. But um, much as Imhotep is a, a celebrated Hollywood um, bad guy, there was a real-life Imhotep in ancient times. And the Hollywood story is not in any way based on the life of the, the genuine historical character Imhotep. Um, although it does draw on some things which are not entirely inaccurate. Um, so this is how we, we would think of the real life Imhotep, uh, if you like. Um, he's typically shown uh, in this pose, seated with this close fitting um, cap, uh, which we saw uh, Imhotep wearing. Um, in, uh, in ancient times in the movie and um, seated and with um with a this is a papyrus roll um on his uh lap and this shows him to be a learned man somebody who is literate able to read and write uh, which was unusual in ancient egypt um, and it's the best way of conveying the idea of somebody being um, learned and capable, wise, etc. And those are exactly the qualities that Imhotep was celebrated for, um, certainly after his lifetime uh, and probably during it as well. So this is a typical sort of representation of Imhotep. This is a bronze uh, statuette, quite a small thing. Now in the, in the museum, which is named after Imhotep at Saqqara, the Imhotep Museum, discovered by the Egypt Exploration Society in the 1960s, um, it would have been a votive offering uh, dedication made to uh, Imhotep uh, by somebody looking uh, to him for guidance or healing or something like that. So what do we know about Imhotep from his life? Well actually um, although we can be sure that this was a real historical person we don't have a lot of evidence for him from his own lifetime. Most of what we know comes from much later. But just to run through what we do have, this is the single best piece of evidence for him. Um, it's uh, a statue, or it's rather, it's the remains of a statue. It's specifically, it's the statue base. So in case it's not clear what you're looking at, um, this is essentially the pedestal of a statue. And at the top of the screen here, you can probably, I hope, make out the feet um, of a person. Uh, it's a, in fact, Imhotep's king, Djoser, Netriket Djoser. The rest of the statue is missing, um, but no matter, because for us what's important is the inscription um, which is on the base. So again, you can see um, the feet broken at the, the statue is broken at the ankles here. Uh, and um, uh, beneath the feet on this plinth, there is uh, an inscribed surface with a series of um, symbols uh, symbolizing stability and those sorts of qualities uh, and in between uh, a sh short, two short hieroglyphic inscriptions. So the name of the king um, is given uh, in the center um, and it's the, it's the very short column of hieroglyphs topped off by a Horus falcon facing to the right. Um, the Horus falcon is above what we call a serech which is a, a, an enclosure um, enclosing the name of the king um, a bit a bit like a cartouche, if you're familiar with cartouches, those sort of lozenge shaped rings um, surrounding uh, the hieroglyphs that make up royal names. This comes from a time before cartouches were in use when when the uh, convention was to use these um, serifs, so called. Uh, and the uh, the symbols inside uh, here um, give us the name um, Netriket which is the uh, the name of the pharaoh we know better um, as Djosa. And to the left of him is a jet, what we call a jed pillar, pillar symbolizing stability. To the left of that, a collection of hieroglyphs which spell out uh, the name and titles of Imhotep. So the name, incidentally, Imhotep, I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, um, but it's, it's these three signs here. So this is a reed feather with walking legs um, that we read as ii, -E, kind of two eyes, if you like, ii. -E. 
Uh, to the left of that, uh, we have an owl, um, which has the, uh, the phonetic value M, so E-E-M, and then this to the left of that uh, low flat sign with what looks like a, an acorn on the top of it, something like that. That is a HETEP sign, um, which has, uh, it is an offering table. It has the meaning of offering table or offerings. Um, it also has the meaning of sort of satisfaction or satisfy, something like that. Um, and all together, um, the name means something like um, the one who comes with satisfaction or something like that, who comes a, a, as, a, as a satisfying presence, E-E-M Hetep. And uh, above and below, we have um, various of his titles and titles are useful to us um, Egyptologists because they are um, often as good an indication as we have of what the, type, the individual did in, in life. Um, so these include, in Imhotep's case, uh, seal bearer of the king of Lower Egypt, the foremost one under the king of Upper Egypt. Those don't really give us much of a sense of, of what his job was, what he was doing. He was the ruler of the great mansion, again, a little bit vague, the noble, chief priest of Heliopolis, that's a very specific role relating to the cult of the sun god uh, Ra, uh, that's a very high status priestly title, one of one of the top three in the country. And then there's this title, um, which actually is written to the right of the Serech of Djoser, um, which uh, is written with the B sign at the top here, B as in B double E, uh, a, a buzzing bumblebee, uh, and then a T sign underneath. Altogether, that's, uh, those two signs together are read as Bitty, uh, which means king of lower Egypt. In this case, it's idiomatic, but that's what it means. And then two of these downward pointing arrows, each of which we read as sen, um, which means something like brother. Uh, and together, uh, they have the, the dual ending we. So sen we. Um, it's a bit difficult for us to understand exactly what this means, but, uh, but if sen is a brother or the brother, two of them is the brothers, uh, so the title reads something like the King of Lower Egypt, the brothers. We don't quite understand what this means, but the interpretation is that Imhotep and the king were like brothers. They weren't actually uh, related in that way. Um, but perhaps the, the sense of this is that they were in some sense equals. Um, if so, that's rather extraordinary because of course the king normally is preeminently important. Um, but in this case, it seems that this person who we already know is the chief priest of, uh, of the sun god Ra at Heliopolis and, and holds a series of other important titles. Perhaps he was so important that he came almost to have equivalent authority to the king. Um, so clearly this is somebody uh, very important. Other than that though, we have very little information about him from his own lifetime. Um, his name appears um, on the mortuary complex of the successor of Djoser, Second Ket. So this enclosure on the map here, labelled C, is the funerary complex, the tomb complex of Djosa. It's the step pyramid enclosure. We'll have a look at that in a second. Um, this enclosure to the south and west, labelled D, is the enclosure, the unfinished tomb complex of Djosa's successor, Second Ket. So it seems perhaps um, that Imhotep survived into the reign uh, of his king's successor. But it, it, it's not much to go on, really. Um, it just suggests that he was still around and important. Um, most of what we know about Imhotep, as I mentioned, comes from after his lifetime. Um, so, and we begin to get the sense of somebody who was celebrated as a, as a kind of famous folk hero from history. Um, this text from uh, of what's called the Harper's Song from the Tomb of King Intef includes the line, I have heard the words of Imhotep and Hardedef, both of them celebrated kind of um, folk heroes, men, men of learning whose words, you know, should be uh, taken very seriously. Um, Imhotep is the leading character on this inscription, in, th in this story, told by what's called the, the famine stealer. It's a rock cut inscription from the island of Sahel um, to just to the south of Aswan. Uh, inscribed on this very large boulder as you can see here and this includes this sort of opening Joseph himself is said to be speaking in this inscription 
He says, I was in mourning on my throne. Those of the palace were in grief because happy, and happy is the God who embodies the river Nile. So happy had failed to come in time. In a period of seven years, grain was scant, kernels were dried up, every man robbed his twin, children cried, the hearts of the old were needy, temples were shut, shrines covered with dust, everyone was in distress. I consulted one of the staff of the Ibis, the chief lector priest of Imhotep, son of Tar, south of the wall. He departed, he returned to me quickly, he let me know the flow of happy. Um, I couldn't really find, um, following this part of the text, the uh, exactly the quote to sort of embody what happens next. But essentially, as you can see, what's happened is that happy has failed to come. What that means is the Nile has failed to flood adequately. Um, the Nile flooded uh, uh, the Nile Valley in Egypt every year, depositing water and fertilizing silts on the land. And that allowed the crops to grow on an annual basis. When the inundation, the flood doesn't happen uh, to a sufficient extent, and the crops don't grow. And if that happens several years running, then it's trouble um, because suddenly, of course, there won't be enough food. And it seems that's exactly what, what, what's happening here. Um, and this not only leads to people being hungry, but also to civil disorder and strife as well. And the king consults Imhotep and says, you know, what should we do? And Imhotep goes to the, the supposed source of the Nile in the south of the country and discovers that what's happened is that the, the god Khnum hasn't been sufficiently uh, worshipped and sent offerings, etc. So he says, what we need to do is keep Khnum happy and then we'll all be fine. And that's exactly what happens. And this solves the problem. Um, so this is a kind of myth. It's a kind of folk tale. We, 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 um, we can't assume that this is really what happened. Um, but nonetheless, it, it's a good example of Imhotep being the sort of great hero of the day. And the text is actually from many, many centuries later. It's from the early Ptolemaic. So um, we're probably looking at two and a half thousand years or so after Imhotep's uh, own lifetime. But still, he's remembered as this great sort of hero. Now, more than anything else, if anybody knows anything about um, real life Imhotep, um, probably the first thing uh, you, would, you would want to say about him, the first thing we all learn about Imhotep, is that he uh, is legendarily the architect of the step pyramid and therefore the inventor of the pyramid the um as a uh, as an architectural feature in egypt uh, and also of uh, building in stone monumental stone building this is this is the first uh, such building so a massive achievement not just for imhotep not just for egypt but for humankind this is the first attempt at building in stone on a massive scale like this so an enormous thing. Uh, and as I say, this is, this is often the first thing that we'll, you, know, you learn about Imhotep, and yet the evidence to connect him with this is actually quite thin on the ground. It comes from uh, Manetho. Manetho was a historian writing, again, in the early Ptolemaic. Um, so Ptolemaic period begins in the, let's say roughly 300 BC. Uh, that's when Ptolemy I begins to establish himself as, uh, as, the, as the ruler of Egypt, as the, as the, the legitimate pharaoh of Egypt. Um, and this um, was written in the reign, of, we're not exactly sure, but probably um, no later than the reign of Ptolemy II or III. So 3rd century BC, Imhotep himself and Josa lived more like 2700. So we're looking at almost two and a half thousand years uh, separation in time. Manetho wrote a history of Egypt, um, which, and he did this based on uh, temple archives, Egyptian temple archives. And you can imagine that with such a huge uh, distance in time um, and basing uh, his, uh, his, his story on uh, records that might not be as kind of comprehensive and reliable and unbiased as we would want, nonetheless, um, the archaeological evidence we've been gathering for the last couple of centuries now suggests that Manetho was really not very far away in, um, in much of what he was writing, not very far away from the truth. Um, Manetho is probably more important um, for anything than, 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 than in any other way in that he provides us with uh, our list of dynasties, 1 to 30. Um, and if you, if you ever hear anybody speaking about Egyptian history, you, you'll hear them referring to 
dynasty this and dynasty that as a way of um, as a way of dating things. Um, and these dynasties come from Manetho and dynasteo is the, is the Greek word that he used for the groups of kings um, that follow one after another, one to thirty. And when he talks about the third dynasty, he tells us, uh, among other things, that the second, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the the first of the kings of this this reign. Uh, is somebody called Tezorthos, um, who ruled for 29 years. Um, and Manetho tends to throw in little sort of nuggets of information uh, um, from time to time, um, along with names of kings, how long they reigned, where they reigned from, that sort of thing. And for this Tezorthos, he says that in his reign lived Imuthes, which is a kind of Greek version of the name Imhotep, who, because of his medical skill, has the reputation of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine, among the Egyptians, and who was the inventor of the art of building with hewn stone. He also devoted attention to writing. So uh, by this time, by the Ptolemaic uh, period, um, this is the period immediately following the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great. So Egypt is very much a part of the, the Greek world, the Hellenistic world by this time. So reference to Greek gods um, was not uncommon. Manetho was writing in Greek because by this time it had become uh, the uh, just about the most important language in use uh, in Egypt alongside Egyptian, various forms of Egyptian. Uh, but Greek and, and the Greek world and Greek gods were important. So the equation of Imhotep with Asclepius is, um, is not surprising, um, but, but interesting to us, of course, because it suggests that the, the Greeks saw in Imhotep uh, the same sorts of qualities as it says here, of learning, writing, healing, medicine, as they saw in Asclepius. But and then there's this also this reference to building in hewn stone. And this is where we get this connection uh, with, uh, with the Step Pyramid. So we can't be absolutely sure that Joseph was the architect of the Step Pyramid, but uh, you know, based on the evidence we have, it seems not impossible, not by any means. And it probably a fair, a fair conclusion that, that this, this is probably right. And in fact, um, because of this equation with um, Asclepius and because Imhotep had come to be revered to such an extent by this point, um, he came to be seen as a god. Um, this is many centuries after, after his death. Um, but from the 26th dynasty onwards, certainly, uh, certainly no later than the 26th dynasty, um, at this point we are in the um, uh, 7th century uh, 7th to 6th centuries BC. Uh, he had a cult. There was a temple dedicated to Imhotep at Saqqara. Uh, and this temple was known to the Egyptians as the Per Imhotep, meaning House of Imhotep. That's the standard way to express the idea of uh, a temple belonging to a particular god. Um, and it was called the Asclepion by the Greeks. So in other words, this, this same building uh, to the Egyptians was the house of Imhotep, to the Greeks it's, it's the house of Asclepius essentially. So what do we know about Imhotep the god? Um, well we've got a whole ton more evidence for Imhotep the god than we have for Imhotep the man. Um, one uh, such piece of evidence is uh, this, it's another statue base in fact, um, inscribed with among other things a list of um, six festivals of Imhotep. Um, days in the calendar when every year the cult of Imhotep and some aspect of his life uh, was celebrated. So um, I've only included the fourth, fifth and sixth of these here because these are the ones which are the most uh, interesting and important for us today. The fourth festival is the Day of Lamentation uh, of Imhotep by his father Ptah when he died. So it, it's, um, it's a day of mourning if you like. Um, for the death of Imhotep, um, not the death of the god, god is still alive, but the death perhaps of, of the man um, who was the origin of the, uh, the idea of the god. Um, the day when he died, his body, his soul, when it reunites. So the idea of body and soul reuniting is an important part for the Egyptians um, of uh, the process of uh, going from the mortal world, dying, and then being resurrected in it, the eternal afterlife, that idea of soul and, and body being reunited. So this has clearly happened. 
Um, the fifth festival um, concerns the day when Imhotep rests before his father, after his death. He goes in and out before the great God. The meeting of the body and the soul takes place, and he rests in the great Dehan grotto dear to his heart. Dehan it, it, it is not a word that we've been able to translate. Dehan is how it's written in the Egyptian. So all we can really say here is that the, the Egyptians, according to this inscription, believed that the tomb, grotto, of course, we, we take to mean subterranean, underground uh, something or other chamber. So that fits the description of your classic Egyptian rock cut subterranean tomb. And this tomb is somewhere in the Great Dehan. And we just unfortunately do not know um, what that is a reference to. The likelihood is that it's Saqqara. Um, all other aspects of Imhotep's life and worship centre on this particular place, as we'll see. Um, but we don't otherwise know whether Dehan is Saqqara or it's a part of Saqqara or it's close to Saqqara. Um, finally, the sixth festival is, uh, celebrates the day when the soul of Imhotep goes out to the, and this is completely, again, untranslatable, so I've had to insert the hieroglyphs here. We don't even know what the sound of these hieroglyphs is. Um, we've been unable to translate it um, or to, 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 to read uh, the phonetic value of it. And this is the great place of repose of the entire land. So again, we don't, we don't exactly know where this place was, but the likelihood is we think it was probably Saqqara or thereabouts. Um, Imhotep was worshipped elsewhere. Um, we are going to be at Saqqara for, for the great uh, majority of the time uh, we're talking about Imhotep today, but he was worshipped elsewhere. So just, just, to, um, just to cover those bases, um, he was worshipped uh, at the Temple of Hathor at Del Medina. Uh, if you're ever there, you go in through uh, the entrance of the temple, which we see in front of us here. Um, uh, keep going, you'll find a column uh, on the left hand side, I think the left of a screen wall, look up um, at sort of ceiling level and you'll see this image of a by now perhaps increasingly familiar seated figure, um, in this case holding a wah scepter in the left hand and an ang symbol in the right, so no papyrus scroll but still seated and with this close, close cropped um, crown. This is Imhotep uh, being worshipped as a god alongside a few others. And he's also worshipped uh, at the Temple of Thoth, uh, another Egyptian god um, associated with writing and learning, um, whom Imhotep came to be associated with. This is very important um, for us later on. This is at Qasr al um, actually a place I've never been to, so I don't have a photo. I had instead to, um, to nick this image from, um, from Google Maps. Um, it, I, I use this because it's very close to Medina Habu, the Temple of Ramses III, whose mummy uh, inspired the Boris Karloff uh, image we saw at the start of the, um, the talk. So if you know your, um, your West Bank in Luxor, uh, you'll perhaps know where to find um, Kasr al it's, uh, it's down at the bottom here, just above the Google sign, um, uh, just a little way along from the entrance uh, to uh, Medina Harbu, if you're visiting. There is a little temple of um, Himahotep at Philae, a little uh, to the right of where this photograph was, um, was taken as we approach the main um, Isis temple. Um, and he's also worshipped in a series of Nubian temples that were built in the first to second cataract um, regions in Debod. That temple has now been moved and it's in Madrid, Kalabsha, also been moved, but still in Egypt on an uh, well, a promontory, which we call New Kalabsha um, and um, uh, Dhaka. Uh, which has been moved to the site, I think, of New Amada. All these uh, temples instantly were moved because this region was flooded uh, by Lake Nasser when the Aswan High Dam was constructed. Um, but so Imhotep is worshipped right up in the north of the country at Saqqara, but then also right the way down as far south um, as this is the second cataract um, and the border uh, between modern day Egypt and Sudan. But most of our evidence for Imhotep comes from objects like this one. Um, this is a rather beautiful um, stealer now in the British Museum collection, British Museum EA 886. Um, this is not um, a stealer involving a dedication solely to Imhotep. In this case, he crops up among a list of gods here. Um, he's the one almost at the extreme right here. Again, you might be beginning to recognize him from the close fitting crown alongside a series of other gods, um, Apis, Isis, Nephthys, 
uh, Raharakti, Anubis, and I think that's probably a manifestation of Horus at the end. Um, so very much a part of the established pantheon of gods. And there are a number of stele like this one, uh, many of them dedicated solely to Imhotep, reflecting his cult and the worship of Imhotep as a god, particularly at Saqqara. Uh, so here we go. Oh, I should have shown you this earlier. Uh, there we go. We see Imhotep slightly more clearly here again, uh, standing this time, again, holding a was and an ankh, but it's that close fitting cap crown that's the giveaway, maybe along with his name uh, written in, uh, in the inscription above. Um, actually, I, I was surprised myself when I was getting ready for this talk, I watched the 1932 uh, Mummy movie again, and um, I wasn't really expecting to see much in the film that drew on anything connecting it with real Imhotep. Um, either the, the, uh, the historical individual and the evidence we have for him from his lifetime, or even the sort of legendary um, god-like figure from, from much later. But actually, um, this idea of the Book of Thoth, which sounds a bit like um, Hollywood myth-making, uh, has uh, some origin in uh, something we can connect to Imhotep. So as it says here, this is the scroll of Thoth, and um, herein are set down the magic words by which Isis raised Osiris from the dead. The next screen is the one that gives us the, the short inscription, O Amun-Ra, O God of Gods, etc. Um, and supposedly, this is the very Book of Thoth itself that we see behind the words here. Um, in actual fact, this is, um, you, can, uh, you can tell if you're familiar with, with such things, um, this is a copy of um, a Book of the Dead Papyrus, probably of the New Kingdom, um, and it's a part of the Book of the Dead, uh, which includes a little vignette, a little drawing, um, showing the, the, the so-called judgment scene and this is the this is the moment in the life of the deceased after their death uh, when they are their life is judged before Osiris, and this happens um, uh, in this way: the individual's heart is weighed against the feather of Mart, which represents sort of truth and justice and harmony and that sort of thing. And the idea is that your heart has to balance against the feather of Mart. If it's heavier, then you've uh, you've not led an entirely good life, and that, in that case, you're not allowed to pass through to the eternal hereafter. But if it balances, you've been a good person, and you can uh, go along to the next point. And Anubis uh, is the god we see here, jackal-headed Anubis, leading the deceased uh, forwards. If the scroll was a little bit uh, more unrolled, we would see Thoth himself probably shown as a human with an ivory's head, um, writing down the result of the, the judgment. That's his role in this, in this case. And Thoth, you may remember, is one of the gods who was associated with Imhotep at Saqqara in the, in the late period and, and Ptolemaic. And actually, I'm sorry, this is a bit te technical and convoluted, but I'm, I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, there is a connection between um, Thoth and, uh, and, and also sacred wisdom, in fact. So I'm going to try and walk you through this. In the reign of Ptolemy IV, um, we have an ostracon. An ostracon is um, a flake of either, typically either limestone or it's a, it's a shard of pottery, something like that, on, which is used and like a piece of scrap paper to write something down on. Um, it's a Greek word which we which we which we borrow from uh, from the Greek world, um, but but it, it just it just means exactly that. Imagine like a scrap of a scrap of paper, but it's either ceramic or limestone, uh, and it's inscribed in this case by a man called Hor, who was we now know a very uh, well known and celebrated interpreter of dreams based at Saqqara. So people would have gone to uh, Hor having had a dream. To wanting to know what, what it was all about and Hor would interpret these for them. So he was an established part of the temple and the sort of clergy, if you like, at Saqqara, uh, which is a place by this time which many, many thousands, not undoubtedly thousands, possibly millions of pilgrimages would uh, be made uh, and people would be going there to, you know, to make offerings and to, and to ask for assistance with things or, you know, indeed to, for their dreams to be interpreted. He writes on this ostracon, 
uh, that uh, it, this is from the scribe of the gnome of Sabenitos, Hor, son of Harin Geotef. So in other words, yeah, he, here's who I am. This is why I'm writing. Here's what I have to say. No man shall be able to lapse from a matter which concerns Thoth, the god in person who holds sway in the temple in Memphis, and likewise Harthoth within it. The benefit which is performed for the Ibis, the soul of Thoth, the three times great, is made for the hawk also, the soul of Tar, the soul of Horus. Now, what, what we learn from this is uh, essentially what he's saying. It's a bit convoluted, um, but essentially what, what he's saying here is that Look, you've got to do things properly. Um, Thoth is the god who holds sway in the temple in Memphis, uh, along with Harfoth, um, Horus, and others. Uh, and you know, if you want to make offerings to him, you've really got to do this um, properly. Um, so the benefit which is performed for the ibis is made for the hawk also. This is a reference to the offering of animal mummies mummies of ibises and hawks and that kind of thing. And we know now that um, it was very popular for people to make offerings of mummified birds like this. And also that the people who were selling these mummified animals, this is how it worked. You'd make your pilgrimage to Saqqara with the intention of making an offering. You would go to a seller of things like uh, steely or mummified animals, you would buy one. They would write on it, whatever it is you want or your name. Um, uh, in a very elaborate way, if you had enough money, and then you would you would you would take this to the appropriate priest or the appropriate place and make this offering, in the hope of getting whatever it is you want from the gods. But uh, it turns out that uh, in many cases the sellers of mummified animals were actually hoodwinking people. They weren't selling them genuine mummified uh, ibises, haw hawks, etc. They were selling them a pile of bones wrapped up in mummy bandages and passing them off as mummified animals. And this came to the attention of the authorities. And Hoare is essentially saying, look, you mustn't do this. Uh, it's very important that you do the right thing. Uh, so if you're going to mummify an ibis, it really must be an ibis, not a pile of bones, a mixture of bones of different animals, that sort of thing. But incidentally, we also learn from this text um, that Thoth has come to be given, this is the first instance of this uh, name, he's come to be given the, the title, the three times great, Thoth the three times great. And this is uh, significant. Um, Sincillus, who is a monk, um, who in the, around about the 10th century AD, so this is again a long time in the future, Sincillus wrote down, um, he copied down the texts of other writers as a way of um, preserving what they'd written and circulating them. One of the writers whose texts Sincillus preserved is Manetho. And Sincillus tells us that Manetho knew Steely in the land of Sairia, inscribed in the sacred tongue in hieroglyphic letters by Thoth, the first Hermes, and translated after the flood from the sacred tongue into the Greek language, set down in books by the son of Agathodimon, the second Hermes, father of Tat, in the sanctuaries in the Temple of Egypt. Manetho dedicated them, these stele within these texts, um, writing thus, since you seek to know what will come to be in the cosmos, I shall present to you the sacred books that I have learnt about, written by your ancestor, Hermes Trismegistus, this is what he says about the translation of the books written by the second Hermes. So this is, again, apologies, this is all a bit convoluted and confusing. But Hermes, another Greek god, also came to be associated with uh, Thoth. So Thoth and Hermes are more or less one and the same in Egyptian religion at at, by this time, they are sort of equivalent to one another. Um, this, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, this is quite a common phenomenon at this time. This is a time following the uh, conquest of Alexander the Great, when there's increasing gr gr numbers of Greek people and Greek influence in Egypt, and the rulers uh, by this time, the Ptolemies, were themselves Greek, and they they realised that they were going to have to keep the population happy somehow. And this meant inventing a religion that was suitable for both Greeks and Egyptians, hence this kind of fusion of the two. What this text is trying to tell us is that originally 
uh, there was a god called Thoth, an Egyptian god, a long, long time ago in the past, who wrote down some incredibly important sacred things um, uh, concerning you know, what will come to be in the cosmos. And these were subsequently copied into Greek by the second Hermes. Um, and he, he did this in order that the Greek reading world could understand these great, much older, ancient Egyptian wisdoms. Um, and these were written about by Hermes Trismegistus. Trismegistus means three times great. Hermes and Thoth are one and the same. So this Thoth, the three times great, and Hermes Trismegistus are one and the same. And um, the uh, Hermes Trismegistus comes to write, so, so we are told, this whole um, swathe of, of texts, um, wisdom texts, concerning the nature of the universe. And these, incidentally, um, are now referred to as the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, or the Hermetica after Hermes um, and they became incredibly important uh, they they are sort of um, musings philosophical musings on the nature of the universe and the nature of man and the nature of the spirit and they became very important to the Neoplatonist philosophers um, and also subsequently to much later scholars in the Enlightenment and these texts survived down to this day in this form and there's a relevance here to Imhotep in that uh, there is a part of the Corpus Hermeticum which says, take your ancestor, this is Horm Hermes Trismegistus himself speaking to Asclepius, take your ancestor, for example, he was the first to discover medicine, Asclepius. They dedicated a temple to him on the Libyan mountain near the shore of crocodiles. There lies his material person, his body, in other words. The rest, or rather the whole of him, if the whole person consists in consciousness of life, went back happier to heaven. Even now he still provides help to sick people by his divine power, as he used to offer it through the art of medicine. So this is all getting a bit confusing here because we've got several different gods, all sort of associated with one another. But in this specific instance, we've got Hermes Trismegistus, who's the original Thoth, talking to Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine, about Asclepius's ancestor. And this, although he's not named here, is clearly Imhotep. It's clearly intended to be the sort of original, older Asclepius, Imhotep, in other words. And, and he says here, his body, um, or the, 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 the whole of him, um, uh, it lies his material person uh, in this temple on the Libyan mountain near the shore of crocodiles. We understand this to be the temple of Imhotep, the Asclepion, and it, it, the implication of this is that this is one and the same as, or at least near to, the tomb of this person. So this is either to be completely disregarded, or it's a guide to where the tomb of Imhotep might be. Again, we don't know what is exactly meant by the Libyan mountain or the shore of crocodiles, um, but we can perhaps begin to ask a few questions about where those places might be. So, as I mentioned, we're going to be at Saqqara for most of this uh, talk today. This is, this is of course, uh, the site at which the Step Pyramid was built. So it's the place where, if we believe that story, Imhotep's greatest achievement is to be found, the Step Pyramid, the very first pyramid. It's also where his cult was many centuries later. Um, and it's also, you know, if we're to believe the, the text we've just been looking at, um, the, the temple and the cult are in the same place as the tomb. Uh, and that would make sense. Um, Saqqara was not just the site of um, the construction of the step pyramid the royal cemetery it was also the cemetery for high-ranking individuals at the same time so even without any of the later evidence if you had to bet where Imhotep's tomb was going to be the safest bet I'd say would be that it's at Saqqara in close proximity uh, to the royals we know that Imhotep was close personally to them during his lifetime uh, and that's it's the kind of thing that an individual like that would do to be buried then in death close to the kings as well. So a quick uh, sort of um, 
uh, aerial tour, if you like, of Saqqara. This is a um, satellite image of the northern part of Saqqara, the North Saqqara Plateau. Uh, the geography of the Nile Valley is, um, uh, is absolutely as you would expect in this part of the world. So the river itself is, is off to the right of the slide here, to the east. Um, north is uh, more or less directly upwards. Um, and as you can see, as is typical of the Nile Valley, the cultivation, cultivated land, the uh, largely green area at the right of the slide, um, sort of stops dead suddenly, and then we get a dry, uh, desolate, sandy desert um, off to the west. And this uh, continues off um, as far as Libya, pretty much. Um, so this is the this is the site we're going to be focusing on today. As you can see, the cultivated land sort of snakes round to the left, to the west, in in a kind of arc here, and that uh, describes the northern extent of our North Saqqara site. For orientation, the most visible monument in the image here is the Step Pyramid itself, which is down almost at the bottom here. Uh, you can perhaps just about make it out. Um, the step pyramid enclosure is is roughly here. Interestingly enough, I um I I this is a screen grab I took a few weeks ago when I was beginning to get ready for this talk. Um, the uh, it's very interesting to see very very visible even from the satellite um, what looks like a um, uh, not quite perfect rectangle in white here. Those are some new pathways which the Ministry of Antiquities has installed in the last couple of years to provide access for wheelchair users, which is um, something new for Egyptian sites, but very welcome, of course, and very visible, apparently, from space. So this is the, um, this is the step pyramid here. Uh, the pyramid of Teti is, uh, is just a little way off uh, to the north and east. And then uh, the Serapium is over here. Um, the access way to the Serapeum, well, the Serapeum is actually here, um, the access route to the Serapeum, the Serapeum way, the snakes across the desert, um, like roughly here, like this, can't quite see it in this map. And then this whole area here to the north um, is, although you can't see very much now, either on the surface or in the satellite image, it's um, quite densely packed with tombs, um, monumental tombs from the first to sixth dynasties, something like that. The ones that are the most visible today um, are concentrated along the escarpment here. This you can't see it in the satellite image, but then there's quite a steep slope at the edge here. Um, so this part of the, the desert is elevated above the Nile Valley and you get fabulous views out across the Nile. Uh, the Nile Valley, the cultivation towards the river, and in fact, right the way across the cultivation to the river, to the beyond, to the cultivation beyond, and then the mountains on the far side. It's amazing. Um, and so uh, it's no surprise that a lot of monumental tombs of uh, rich and powerful individuals were built along here because they would have had terrific views um, of the Nile Valley, but also probably of the city of Memphis, which would have been somewhere down here. We're not exactly sure where. Um, so just zooming in a little bit, um, this again, this is the Step Pyramid uh, enclosure here with the Step Pyramid itself in the centre here. Um, the Hebsed Court um, defined by this new walkway here, um, the dummy tomb at the south here for those of you who know the monument um, well. Um, and Saqqara Saqqara was in use then, so so you know, as I was as I was saying, there there are there are monumental tombs from the first to sixth dynasties uh, all around this sort of area here and further to the north. And Saqqara, as a royal cemetery, came and went a bit. Um, it seems to have been the, the burial place of kings in the second dynasty. In the third, uh, in the fourth, um, the cemetery moved uh, in the reign of Sneferu um, to Maidum, then to Darshur. Uh, it then moved under Khufu to Giza, it went briefly north to Abu Rawash, it came back to Giza again, it then went to Abu Sir, which is a little way to the north, came back to Saqqara in the 5th dynasty. Um, 
nonetheless, on and off, Saqqara was the royal cemetery, and it was it was a um, a cemetery of high ranking people, almost throughout Egyptian history. Um, and by the time of what we call the late period, the 26th to 30th dynasties, and then the succeeding period, the Ptolemaic um, and beyond, into Roman and late antique times, Saqqara continued to be an important place um, as a cemetery, but also a, a cult uh, place as well. And there were a number of gods which became um, the focus of worship at Saqqara at that time, including the Apis bull, now the Apis bull is, uh, is it, again, this is slightly sort of complicated, but it, it was considered to be the bar, which is the soul. It's one aspect of the soul of the god Ptah during its lifetime. But on the death of the bull, it became uh, a manifestation of Osiris, the lord of the underworld. And the Apis bull was an actual bull. Um, so, so at a certain point, um, uh, I think at least as far back as the New Kingdom, 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties, Apis became important and it became the belief that the bull, the, the god itself was manifest in a bull and the you'd be able to identify the bull by its markings. So the priests would go to the fields and find the right bull, a bit like the Dalai Lama is sort of identified among children in Tibet. Um, they would then take this bull away to the temple where it would be worshipped as a god um, for the rest of its lifetime. Um, and on its death, it would be given a full ceremonial burial in a series of underground vaults, uh, which we call uh, the Serapium, which is at Saqqara. And by the late period in Ptolemaic, these tombs, uh, these catacombs, underground catacombs for the burial of the sacred bulls had become very elaborate, very large, um, and um, the, the cult of the Apis had become just about the most important cult in the area. Alexander the Great himself was very taken by the Egyptians' devotion to the Apis bull when he visited Memphis. Um, so this is uh, the Apis on the left-hand side shown in this case on the foot. This is the footboard. It's the end of a coffin. So um, if you can imagine just the other side of this is the, the feet of the deceased individual. Um, and he's shown here bearing the deceased on his back, sort of galloping away towards uh, the afterlife. Um, Tar was the principal deity of Memphis, which was Egypt's capital city. He's a kind of creator god um, shown with a, a close fitting crap cap crown like um uh like Imhotep was and typically holding this um staff in this position this is a very fine example from the tomb of Tutankhamun which gives you an idea hopefully of what you would expect um Ptah to look like this is the Serapium um these are what uh are known now as the greater this is the greater vault there's a series of catacombs lesser vault greater vault some individual burials as well the greater vault is a long corridor with um, vaulted uh, rock cut, we are underground here, um, chambers either side of the corridor, each of which houses one of these humongous um, hardstone sarcophagi, which would have received the mummified uh, Apis bull at death. So it's an incredibly spectacular place um, and the focus of um, pil many pilgrimages uh, in ancient times. The Apis became so important and so uh, much revered that its mother also came to be worshipped as a god. So every time the new Apis bull was identified, the priests would not only take off the Apis itself, the bull, they would go and seek out the mother of the bull and cart her off as well so that she could be worshipped. And the mother was associated with the goddess Isis. Um, who is the sort of mother goddess par excellence by this point. She's the mother in Egyptian mythology. Isis is the mother of Horus, the great um, king god uh, of the Egyptians. Uh, so she came to be venerated no less than the 6th century BC. And the, the, the mother of Apis, Cal, was then also buried in a series of underground vaults. To add to this, according to this bit of mythology in this bit of Egypt at this time, the father of Isis um, was Thoth, the lunar god we've already heard about, associated with the moon, typically shown 
uh, as uh, in human form, but with an ibis head, sometimes manifested as an ibis, sometimes as a baboon also. For this reason, the mummification of these animals and burial of those animals also became very important. The key difference here is that in, it, there was no one uh, Thoth baboon or Thoth ibis at this point. Anyone could buy uh, an ibis or a bo baboon mummified and have them be uh, buried in, in, in the catacombs. These probably began to be buried uh, no later than the 30th dynasty. So by this point, we've got bulls, cows, uh, ibises and baboons. Finally, the lunar god Thoth is balanced by a solar god, in this case, uh, the falcon Horus. Um, and we see him here in a, a, a looking like a, a very angry uh, hawk um, in the Temple of Horus at Edfu um, down in the south of Egypt. This meant that we were also getting burial of sacred falcons as well. So suddenly, lots and lots and lots of animal mummies and lots and lots of dedication of sacred animal mummies as well. So how does this connect to Imhotep and how does this help us with the search for his tomb? Well, um, these uh, catacombs were discovered uh, to be a part of the North Saqqara Plateau. So this map shows us in a bit more detail um, what we might expect to see underneath the sand uh, at Saqqara. So again, for purposes of orientation, this is the Step Pyramid complex here with the Step Pyramid at its uh, centre. Um, the Serapium, the burial place of the Apis bulls, is off to the west here. So this is where those catacombs are underneath the ground. Uh, there would have been an avenue of sphinxes guiding visitors from uh, the city of Memphis, somewhere down here in the cultivation, across the desert to the Serapium here to make dedications. Um, the line of that is mm, sort of visible in the satellite uh, image. Um, there was then an enclosure for sacred cats. It's another sacred animal here, um, which uh, made for uh, the creation of a um, temple and a, and a temple enclosure, which is what you see here called the Northern Enclosure. This, this became known as the Bubastiaeon um, after the cat goddess Bastet. There was another enclosure here, not shown on this map, which is referred to as the Inubiaeon, after the god Anubis, and this led to the burial of sacred dogs here. And then it's in this region that we've got ibises, hawks, baboons, the mother of Apis cows, um, and, uh, and more ibises up here. And this, you'll recall, is also the area where the monumental tombs from the time of Imhotep were to be found. You might also recall um, that the tomb of Imhotep was thought to be in the same place as the temple of Imhotep, which is somewhere at Saqqara. And in the 1960s, this man, W.B. Emery, Brian Emery, made it what turned out to be his last great mission to try to find the very tomb of Imhotep in exactly this area. Emery was a, one of the sort of last great archaeologists, um, if you like, um, by, uh, he started out in Egypt in the early 1920s. He, uh, he started working in the Luxor area in around about 1922, almost the exact moment that Howard Carter discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. He knew Carter, he worked alongside him, he had lots of stories about Carter. Um, and he had an incredibly successful career as an excavator and made a whole string of important discoveries uh, in the Luxor area in Sudan. And at, from the 1930s onwards, Saqqara, where he took over as the sort of main Egyptian government uh, antiquity service archaeologist in the area. Um, he, as I say, began in the 1920s and was working up until the very early 1970s. And by that time, he was very old school. Um, he employed hundreds of workmen. So huge excavations, um, masses of uh, um, debris being moved, huge quantities of archaeology being, uh, being unearthed. Um, he was one of the last greats uh, in this way. Um, he's in a book which, uh, if you'll excuse the um, shameless plugging, um, a, a book I've written called Egyptologist Notebooks, which is kind of history of Egyptology. 
um, as told through 30-ish um, characters like Emery and their notes, drawings, maps, plans, that kind of thing. He's the last character in this book because for me, he's kind of the last of the, of the giants of uh, a golden age of archeology. span um, And in fact, um, this is a couple of pages from the book and um, this is his sketch plan, which he added to over the years of the discoveries that he made at Saqqara. He was discovering tombs in particular like this, these are monumental tombs of a kind we, we give the name Mastaba. Um, Mastaba is an Arabic word. Um, it, um, it's used for the kinds of either little platforms or benches, seats essentially, um, that you find in front of typical uh, Egyptian houses. So uh, houses often feature these seats in front of them so that members of the household and the family can sit and while the day away chat, um, engage passers-by in conversation and they, they they are sometimes simple mud platforms for, for people to sit on um, you know plastered and painted and these very large tombs are essentially the same sort of shape just on a much 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 bigger scale so they were given by Egyptologists a long time ago the name Mastaba and and that is now how we refer to these giant tombs um, they evolved from simple burial mounds so in the very earliest times, Egyptians were, were buried in, in simple pits with a mound of, of, of stones or brick above them. And gradually those mounds became bigger and straight sided. And eventually these giant rectangular platforms built of, as I say, mud brick. The largest are 50 meters in length, 20 or 30 meters uh, width, sort of 10 or so meters in height. And they tend to overlie subterranean burial chambers. So that's what you see here in this section. This is the, this is the Mastaba itself um, with a, a rock cut subterranean burial chamber underneath. Some of these are extremely elaborate. As you can see, this is um, tomb number 3035 belonging to a man called Hemar Kar. Um, this is an aerial view of the tomb showing that the Mastaba itself contained numerous little chambers um, which would have been used uh, for grave goods, potentially subsidiary burials, that kind of thing. Um, they often feature these sort of crenellated walls which mimic um, the design of, we think, fortified Egyptian palaces. Um, they were sometimes found with very elaborate grave goods. So this um, tomb number 3111 was found with a mass of um, jars of pottery which had been um, sent away to the afterlife of the deceased. Um, a subsidiary burial, as you can see here, of, a, of an individual in a crouched kind of fetal position. Um, there was even one um, which uh, was given the number 3038, which had a kind of stepped appearance here, which Emery believed actually may have been a kind of precursor of the step pyramid. It's difficult to prove that connection, but it was a very interesting discovery uh, nonetheless. So he had a great history of discovery at uh, Saqqara and in these last seasons, his last six seasons, um, he was excavating on, as you can see here, a, a, a huge scale. Um, I really love this photograph, uh, which is in the Egypt Exploration Society's um, archives. You can see Emery here at the bottom right, uh, walking stick. Uh, in hand, pipe in mouth, not paying apparently any attention to what's going on around him, uh, despite the fact that this is hundreds and hundreds of workmen um, excavating um, this sacred animal necropolis, which it came to be known as by this time. Um, so this, as I mentioned, this, this area to the north of the Step Pyramid was the site of numerous Mastaba tombs, but it was also intriguingly covered with much, much later Ptolemaic and Roman pottery. So you've got this strange sort of juxtaposition of uh, two uh, remains from two different periods. The very earliest time in, in Egyptian history, first, first few dynasties, one, two, three, uh, and, then, and then something from the opposite end of ancient Egyptian history anyway, apparently a, a frenzy of ritual activity. And Emery wrote, the juxtaposition of the remains of these two periods was indeed significant and at once brought to mind the possibility that here, in this place, only about 700 metres from the step pyramid enclosure, we might discover the Asclepion and the tomb of Imhotep. What he's thinking is that there's a whole load of tombs which are of the right date to be the tomb of Imhotep. 
and also loads of ritual activity from the time when we know Imhotep was worshipped as a god. What are the chances that this is the right place? So he began excavating in this area and very quickly began making discoveries. Um, he found a very large master tomb of the right date, third dynasty, which he gave the number 3508, which was found to be preserved to a height of 3.8 meters um, above the, the ground. So this would be below the modern surface level, the, below the current level of the sand, but 3.8 meters above what was the ancient floor level, not the full height of the tomb, but still a, a, good, uh, a good amount preserved. And he found that um, the walls of this mastaba exhibited this interesting behavior, these kinds of scrapings, which um, you may have seen uh, in other places, particularly on temple walls and places, for example, Luxor. This is the product of the belief, um, which goes back a very long way, but is still current in Egypt, that the very fabric, the stone of temples or mud brick in the case of these tombs, itself has kind of magical properties. And if you can get a little bit of it, um, then you can take it away. Maybe you can put it into a drink or something and you, you'll, you know, you, those, some of those magical properties will, um, will be conferred upon you. So if you're looking for healing or um, you're looking to conceive a child, something like that, you, you might uh, look to this sort of magical material um, to help you out in that regard. And this particular master tomb exhibited this as if the ancients, and these were ancient scravings, believed that it had particular significance. It was rather complicated, this mastaba, because apart from its third dynasty uh, history, it was subsequently sort of messed about with in later times as well. So the, the main part of the, the mastaba is in, is in the middle here, where you can see dynasty th three tomb labelled. It's covered with pottery all over the top of it. It's then cut into here uh, and two bull burials apparently made in this cutting in the mastaba. And there was then a burial shaft um, and this broke through underneath into something very interesting, as we shall see. It was also found in this area that there were literally millions of jars like this, looking a bit like World War II shells. This, this sort of um, cylindrical tapering jars with little lids on containing ibis mummies. And there were literally millions of these found in these catacombs so clearly this was an incredibly busy place um, and many many thousands of people wanted to to leave their mark here it was obviously a very very important place of pilgrimage the mummies themselves were very elaborately wrapped and quite often featured designs these are some of the finest um, featuring either ibis birds or baboons. And these aren't mummy, they're mummified ibises inside, but the, but the presence of both ibises and baboons in the iconographies it is important because they both evoke the god Thoth. And Thoth, of course, has a connection with Imhotep. So um, we've got pottery, broken offering tables um, around the base of the walls here. And these were all of third dynasty dates. So we know the mastaba was originally a third dynasty mastaba. And then we've got all this later activity as well. Sadly, there was no evidence of the name of the tomb owner. So Emery didn't have that clinching piece of evidence he needed to say, this is it. This is the tomb of Imhotep. That's why there's all this later ritual activity. But it might have been. It's not case on, uh, it's not uh, proven either way. And this is unfortunately not uncommon in tombs of this time. And we're very fortunate in Egyptology that we often have inscriptions and the inscriptions often give us the names of tomb owners. But in the earliest times, inscriptions are much less common. Um, so the example of a tomb like this one, S2405, belonging to a man called Hezi Ra is, is rare. And in this case, the tomb was decorated with these incredibly beautiful wooden panels. This is a tomb of the third dynasty. It's, so it's nearly these panels uh, of wood um, carved in high relief are almost 5,000 years old um, and incredibly beautiful. Some of the earliest instances of decoration like this in a, an Egyptian tomb, and they give us the name of the owner, Hezi Ra. So in this case, we know this was his tomb, but this is rare. We don't always find this. So Emery must have known from the beginning that even if he found the tomb of Imhotep, he might not necessarily be able to identify it uh, for certain. And he actually found a whole series of tombs 
packed incredibly tightly together. So this is 3508 here, bottom left, the one we've just been looking at. But as you can see, all these other shapes, rectangles, are all master platoons. And 3510, 3513, given these numbers because we don't know the names of the individuals who were buried in them. 3509, um, the next one he found was made of stone and built for a much later individual, 5th dynasty, called Hetep Kar. This one was decorated, but not so interesting because it's the wrong date. 3510 um, was another 3rd dynasty tomb, however, and again preserved to a great height. You can just get a sense of the walls of the Mastamba from this photo here. And it's with the burial shaft of 3510, the excavation of the burial shaft, that Emery made an incredible discovery. He dug down into the mastaba and found that at the bottom of it, it broke through into the subterranean catacombs, um, which were dedicated to the burial of these millions and millions of Ibis mummies. So once they enter these catacombs, they can begin to walk around and they see that just as with the Serapium, you have corridors with chambers off to the side, in this case, stuffed full of sacred Ibis mummies. And after only a season, this is how much of the, the catacomb they had discovered. So, so these are our um, Mastaba tombs superimposed on a map of the subterranean uh, corridors um, of, this, uh, of this network of catacombs. So you can imagine what an incredible sort of Indiana Jones moment this was, breaking through on the way down into this labyrinth of, of corridors. It must have been quite an incredible moment for the team. And Emery wrote at the end of the season, the extent of this labyrinth is still unknown. We are yet ignorant of the beginning and end of this great underground structure, although we have explored with some difficulty hundreds of yards of its passages. Part of it are completely clear, but others are filled with sand and rubble to such an extent that we could only crawl just below the ceiling. So right at the very beginning, they've made an astonishing uh, discovery uh, and have no idea where the end is going to be. Many of the galleries which stand four meters high and 2.5 meters wide are packed with mummies of ibis still undisturbed in their pottery jars. There are literally thousands and thousands of these strange deposits of this bird which at Memphis in Ptolemaic times was sacred to Imhotep. Although our excavations are as yet only in their early stages and it is therefore not possible to be dogmatic, I think, that in all probability we have located part of the long lost Asclepiaeon and that connected with it we shall find the tomb of Imhotep. I love this. You don't get this kind of thing in scientific reports anymore. But just imagine being a subscriber to the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, a member of the Egypt Exploration Society in the 1960s. You've paid your subscription fee to support the archaeological work and this is, this is what the report says at the end of the year. Um, what an enticement to resubscribe send a new donation in for the next year. So in the 1966 to 7 season, that's the next season, the excavations move to the north. Uh, they find a temple enclosure and a platform. They find cattle bones, inscriptions mentioning the mother of Apis. And this eventually leads them to the discovery of um, an entire temple complex um, built up against uh, a, a sort of snaking line of cliffs here and it's the cliffs into which the catacombs were cut. So they had broken into the sort of the middle of the, the network of Ibis catacombs, if you like, but here they found the entrances, not only to the Ibis catacombs, but eventually to the baboon catacombs, uh, the mother of Apis catacombs as well, and an entire network of uh, underground passageways for the burial of all these different kinds of animals. This is the entrance to the baboon catacomb. So you can see this is the natural cliff in the back here uh, with um, an entranceway cut into the rock and then sort of embellished with a, a stone built doorway. And the temple complex is then built in and around these, these uh, low cliffs. They found temple equipment here. These would be sort of incense burners, torch holders for the inside of the temple. It's very rare to find this kind of everyday stuff from a from a temple. They found uh, miniature shrines containing statues, um, bronze statues themselves. Um, this is a very charming statue of um, Isis and Horus the child. 
um, showing Isis in this very sort of motherly pose. Um, a broken, but nonetheless clearly very beautiful image of um, Osiris. Um, and a little Apis bull calf on a, on a sled. Um, baboon statues. Um, these two have, were given names by the EES team. I think Algernon and Percival, something like that. Anyway, they're, they're Thoth, really. Um, and they find another tomb. Um, the baboon galleries broke into a tomb called, which they gave the number 3518 which was enormous, 52, by, 52 meters by 19 meters, one of the largest in the necropolis, has an unusual design. It's this one here, has a kind of double um, burial chamber arrangement, um, and it is absolutely enormous, very close to this is the temple complex here, and overlying the baboon galleries here. Um, it was found to have some stone elements as well as an enormous mud brick superstructure and in and around this area they found this ceiling which bears I don't know if you'll be able to see it but the serech of Netri Ketz Josa which we saw on the statue base at the very beginning of the talk so this dates uh, this mastaba not only to the third dynasty but specifically to the reign of Josa more than that these were also found in the area as well and Emery called these body part donaria and as you can see they are ceramic um, or sometimes stone I think uh, images of parts of the body so we're looking at eyes and nose here but there were also ears uh, hands uh, eyes that kind of thing and the theory is that these were placed in this area as um, part of a sort of petition or a prayer to the god for healing of some kind of sickness relating to these parts of the body. So if you've got a, a problem with your sinuses, you would purchase one of these so-called donaria uh, and you would then take it to the place of the god to ask for healing. And they're here in this place at a third dynasty tomb. Could this have been the tomb of Imhotep? One last possibly clinching piece of evidence is it's absolutely aligned with the step pyramid. It's on the exact same alignment. So uh, to cut a long story short, Emery never found the clinching piece of evidence. He never found a third dynasty item with the name of Imhotep on it. But most people um, interested in this sort of thing, myself included, think that if Emery did find the tomb, this is the best candidate for it. We may never know that clinching piece of evidence never came up, but this is a very strong possibility. We will never know, perhaps, uh, if um, there might have been another tomb in the area, or at least we, we never got to find out um, during Emery's time, because shortly after this photograph was taken, this was taken on Christmas Day in the house at Saqqara, um, Emery, who you see on the right-hand side here, passed away on site, um, he collapsed on site, was taken to hospital in Cairo, where he had a stroke a few days later and, um, and passed away. And he was buried in the British Cemetery in Cairo. This was at the beginning of 1971. So he never finished his excavations. His massive documentation um, eventually led to the publication of a, a, a series of volumes about the sacred animal Acropolis. Um, all different kinds of objects and texts that were discovered with it, including the archive of Hor, the dream interpreter, which was discovered during these uh, years. Um, but Emery, Emery himself never got to find what he was looking for. And who knows, had he stayed alive, perhaps he would have continued his excavations. There's little doubt he would have found more tombs. Uh, perhaps the tomb of Imhotep was still waiting for him. So could it be... The 3508, actually, the first one he found uh, was the tomb of Imhotep. Could it be 3518, the strange double tomb that we've just been looking at? Or is it still out there? Uh, a long time later, um, 30 or so years later, the Saqqara Geophysical Survey Project um, of the National Museums of Scotland, led by Ian Matheson, was doing some ge geophysical work in the area of the North Saqqara Plateau and came across two enormous rectangles. Um, lying beneath the sand just north of the Serapian Way. This is the Serapian Way here, which showed up very, very well, very clearly in these um, geophysical surveys. These mastabas have never been excavated before, and Matheson speculated 
that they may have been uh, they might, one or the other of them might be the tomb of Imhotep. They are still waiting for somebody to go and excavate them uh, and um, and see if they can find a, a name. And just to conclude, sorry, Sarah, have I got like a, a minute or two for just a, a couple of slides okay yeah that's so i i i went off in um april 2015 to see what i could see uh not um expecting that uh, you know i would be able to uh, to go and find the tomb of, of in at this point but just to just to get a feel for the lie of the land um one thing that was very striking for me also for emory um although i didn't include um, a quote from him on this is that you may remember that um description in the corpus hermeticum is of um the position of the Asclepiae on the tomb of Imhotep being close to the Libyan mountain, and that could be the Libyan mountains run right the way along the west of the Nile Valley from north to south uh, in Egypt. So that's very vague. That could be anywhere. Shore of crocodiles is perhaps more interesting because a little way to the north of North Saqqara, where the sacred animal necropolis is, and that's more or less where I was standing when I took this photograph, was a lake in ancient times. It's dried up now, but there's still sufficient water in the ground um, for this sort of little, these little scrubs and these trees here to be growing. So this is the remains of an ancient lake. Um, it is possible that that, is the sh that that was the shore of crocodiles. Um, that was Emery's thought, um, that this, this could be the nearby feature uh, that is um, associated with the tomb in, in the Hermeticum. Um, I wrote about this, incidentally, I wrote about this um, slightly madcap uh, wander across the North Scarra Plateau in a, in a blog post, uh, which is on my website, and I'll direct you to another page, which will help you find this uh, when I get to the end. Um, so I, I went off with, um, with an iPad, some satellite images, um, uh, a GPS enabled iPad to try and see what was visible on the surface and if nothing to just go and stand on the spot. Um, and in fact, to my surprise, some of these things show up actually very well in the satellite images. So this is this is zoomed in as much as possible on an iPad at the time into just into Google Maps, the satellite image in Google Maps. This is 3518, the second of those very, very large or the last of those very large mastaba tombs that, that Emery found. It shows up very well in Google Maps. This is the uh, the temple enclosure here. The, this is the line of the cliffs into which the catacomb entrances are built. This has sanded up quite a lot. Um, the drift sand uh, blows and accumulates very quickly here, but still it's, it's quite visible. And um, to my surprise and delight, on the surface, on the ground, 3518 was very visible. Um, you can see these two huge chambers here. Uh, they have sanded up quite a lot, but you get an idea of the, the scale of the walls here of this huge mastaba, which is aligned with the step pyramid, which you can see off in the distance there. So this, as, as I mentioned earlier, for my money, this is the best candidate we have so far for the tomb of Imhotep. Is it possible that, that, that this was it? This was the place where this great man was buried, perhaps? And um, this is what the temple complex looks like. So this is the entrance to the baboon catacombs here. Uh, you can just about make out a stone built miniature staircase here, m monumental mud brick walls, a stone gateway, the stone doorway beyond. It's not a lot to see, but it's quite an atmospheric place. The more so because this um, part of the Sakara Plateau is off limits. I needed to get special permission to be here. So it was as quiet as uh, quiet gets when I was here. Um, very odd in some ways to think that this would have been such a busy, thriving, noisy, smelly area in uh, in ancient times with all these pilgrims milling around. Um, this incidentally is Emery's house and um, this is my colleague S.M. Nagy from the Egypt Exploration Society who um, facilitated my visit. This is Emery's house in the background, um, now used as a storage facility by the Ministry of Antiquities. And these are little narrow gauge railway carts. Um, I don't honestly know if they're the ones that Emery used, but he did use a narrow gauge railway um, to convey the debris away from his excavations and they're now just abandoned in the area of Emery's house and I thought it was quite uh, interesting to see that um, these relics of um, the work of archaeologists are now themselves becoming part of the archaeology of Saqqara. They'll eventually become buried of course, somebody will dig them up in the future. Um, here they are. This is um, that's not Emery House, but it's part of the series of buildings in that area. 
So could it be that the team of Imhotep is um, is still out there, right? Maybe it is. Maybe it's 3518, maybe not. In any case, um, I, I hope uh, to have been able to sort of illustrate this idea that Imhotep, Imhotep had, a, had a life in the Third Dynasty. He was a real life individual. He has a sort of subsequent afterlife um, as, a, as a god in ancient times and then another one as a Hollywood um, bad guy. And um, it's thanks probably more to it than anything else to the Hollywood movie that we know this name, we know the name Imhotep. And for the ancient Egyptians, one way in which you could sort of become immortal, you could live on forever, was for people to remember your name. Um, and thanks to his status as a god and thanks to Hollywood, we do know his name. So perhaps, um, Wherever he was buried, he he would be happy to know that we are still talking about him. So um, so thanks for listening. Um, sorry to have overrun slightly. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Sarah, in particular for for your patience. Um, with um, my talks, I I always try because I'm aware that I, I'm sort of skipping over things very quickly. I try to put up a page of um, notes and um, links to online resources if you want to take your interest in any of these things a bit further. Um, so there is a page on my website underneath lectures, uh, you'll find a series of uh, other pages. Um, the second to last of which at the moment is searching for Imhotep links and further reading. Uh, so you'll, you'll find links to all the various uh, sources I've used for this talk and photos and one or two other things if you, if you do want to follow up. Um, I should also, I hope you'll forgive me, um, plug these two books. Um, the, the search for Imhotep is uh, make, makes um, makes up the first chapter of my book on lost tombs. So uh, if you're interested in reading more, there's uh, there is more in there. And Emery, as I mentioned, along with Howard Carter and Flinders Petrie and various others, um, is going to be uh, one of the characters featured in um, Egyptologist Notebooks, which is coming out um, later on this year in October, 1st of October, Egyptologist Notebooks is out. So um, with that, I shall say again, apologies for overrunning. Thank you for your patience. And um, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really amazingly interesting. And there were bits in it as well that I wasn't expecting you to bring up that especially interested me. I knew about the relationship between Imhotep and Asclepius, and that, but there were some things that really got me thinking. Um, you were talking about Imhotep's name, meaning uh, bringing about satisfaction. And mm. Asclepius is associated with Telesphorus, who is... Mm -hmm the bringer of completion or fulfillment mm. as well. And I wondered actually if there's anything uh, in the Imhotep legends, and I was wondering about the Wast Scepter actually, because Asclepius has his snake entwined staff and the Wast Scepter is an animal staff and Asclepius is also associated with the dog as well. So there's a few things there that I find amazing about Imhotep because the, because also the sleep temple aspect of the Imhotep Asclepian idea as well. And you have those same votive offerings in ancient Greek sleep temples and Asclepians of giving clay versions of body yes. parts healing as yes. well. So yeah, yeah, really yeah. In, in Rome also, yeah. Mm. Yeah, we don't, um, we don't know in all the details um, how it, exactly how it came to be that these various Egyptian and Greek gods come to be conflated. Um, in in one particular case, it was seems to have been a very deliberate ploy on the part of probably Ptolemy the first. So you know, I mentioned that um, basically the the, in, the you know the new foreign pharaoh of Egypt had had to, to find a way of um, uh, of creating a religion that would be acceptable to both Egyptian and Greek people. And the god Serapis, I didn't I didn't quite mention this, but uh, the god Serapis came to be just about the most important deity in the Ptolemaic period. Mm -hmm. And Serapis is a Greek form of Osiris Apis, Osorapis, Serapis, um, who is a combination of Osiris Apis and the Greek god Zeus. And, it, and Serapis has the form of the classical god Zeus. Um, and he seems to have been created as a new preeminent deity for the Ptolemaic period. Um, quite how, um, say, Imhotep and Asclepius come to be associated, um, Thoth and Hermes, 
Imhotep and Thoth, there's sort of overlap there as well. Quite how all that comes about is a bit obscure. Um, but I mean, there are, so there are some very obvious reasons for associating them. And it, it may well be that their iconography is a part of it. You're right, it could be. Um, Isn't there any references you've seen to uh, Imhotep um, about going to sleep in like the sacred precincts of Imhotep and having dreams of contact with Imhotep because that's how the Asclepians functioned with Asclepius was that he could appear. That's super know. interesting. I don't know. That, that's super interesting. I'm away from my um, library at the moment while I'm with my dad mowing his lawn and um, uh, looking after him a bit the fall. Uh, there is a, the, I have the publication of the Archive of Hoare, who's this great dream interpreter um, back at home. I will dig this out. Um, I suspect Imhotep does figure in dreams, mm. um, but I wasn't aware of that connection. Um, so I, I have to say, sorry, it's a bit, bit unsatisfactory, but I have to say, I'll get back to you on that. But um, if, that, if there is that connection there, then, um, yeah. then that would be super interesting. Um, and is there, isn't there the plaque of, I think it was at the British Museum last time I saw it, it might have been in the Sunken Cities exhibition, of the dream interpreter who's a Cretan on the Serapian Way? Yes, uh, yes, I know this. it's a stealer, I think you refer to, oh, a yeah. very beautiful dream interpretation uh, Stealer, yes, it's a sort of advert, isn't it, for the services of a dream interpreter? Um, uh, I know it actually, f I was just looking at it, so it was in an exhibition on Cleopatra about 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, but yes, uh, yes, exactly. And 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 that dream interpreter and those people looking for dream interpretations are all going to the same place as as you've got the Apis bull cult, the mummification of sacred animals, and, and the Asclepion, Temple of Imhotep, Tomb of Imhotep. It's all in that same sort of area. We don't still don't exactly understand all the ins and outs of it. Um, the area's never still been completely excavated, but, uh, you know, all, all those things are clearly linked. Mm. That's great. Does anyone else have any other questions? We just have a little bit uh, more time, maybe like 15 minutes or so. Uh, you can turn your, you should be able to turn your mics on. Can you not turn your mics on? I want it, I wonder if anybody's posted a there are in the chat. Um, but, uh, um, are there any plans to excavate? A, 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 a... Oh, I'm getting a, I'm getting a bit of echo. Yeah. Um, Sarah, is that a question from the chat? That was a question from the chat, yeah, hang on. Uh, let me just see if I can find it. Are there any, I, I'm guessing that, I didn't quite hear it all, I'm guessing the um, uh, the end of that question was, was probably, are there any plans to excavate yeah. in that area, North Sakara? Um, not as far as I know, um, I suppose is the short answer. Um, the as about 20 years ago um the egyptian ministry of antiquities made a decision that there were too many excavations going on excavation is is in some sense destructive um we're, you we're all taught as archaeology under undergraduates that um um excavation is the unrepeatable experiment um it's scientific but unlike you know your average scientific experiment you can't do it more than once once you've done it that's that you can't dig something out of the, the ground a second time. Uh, there was too much excavation going on and not enough conservation work and, and preservation of standing monuments. So they, um, they decided that they had to stop excavations, um, at least in the Nile Valley, or they had to stop new ones. Um, and Saqqara was, it was considered to be the place where there were more excavations than any other, and that was somewhere that they really should be stopped. And um, since then, uh, I can think of, with, with one or two exceptions, there there hasn't been very much excavation work in the North Saqqara Plateau. Um, so, I, yeah, I, not as far as I know, but just to be absolutely clear, um, there are, uh, if you could sort of click your fingers and remove the sand from the North Saqqara Plateau, you would suddenly see what would look like a kind of city of monumental tombs. They're just buried. They're all there. 
Um, some of them are the ones that Emery excavated. Other, other, other people also have excavated, particularly along the edge of the escarpment, which overlooks the cultivation. But there are other parts of that um, plateau that have never been excavated. So, um, you know, I've, chief among them, perhaps, those two very large rectangles that Ian Matheson saw in the geophysics. Um, I mean, they've got to be huge master teams. There's no doubt that's what they are. Um, so at some technology. point, somebody will, will go and have a look. Is there new technology, like things like LIDAR scanning that is being used now to kind of... As far as I know... Slightly the, less... The, there, are, there are new techniques. As far as I know, um, the, uh, the technology that Matheson was using, which was primarily, I think, uh, um, uh, magnetometry, ground penetrating radar, and I'm not the expert here, possibly electrical resistivity tomography, um, I'm like an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just learned the words. Um, it's certainly magnetometry and GPR, jet ground penetrating radar. As far as I know, those are still the best techniques uh, available for this kind of um, ground. But basically, um, lidar was never used here. But lidar is really brilliant for penetrating, say, foliage. So that's why it's been so incredibly successful in. Central and South America in seeing archaeology beneath the rainforest canopy. Um, it, as far as I'm aware, can't see underground. Um, satellite imagery also, uh, you know, has become more um, used since Matheson's time, but it's not better than what he was using, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, and there comes a point as well, it's worth saying, it, it comes a point where you you need to excavate um because as i was saying in egyptology we're very lucky that um we're able to read inscriptions so much of the time um and uh no remote sensing technique will see that no no remote sensing technique will see something as small as that so you've got to dig um if, if you want to for example identify the owner of those tombs Okay. Um, I've got another question here from Tracy. She says, what started your initial interest in Egyptology? Um, good question. Um, I, I, I've been asked this quite a lot, so I've sort of rehearsed an answer now. Um, I, I, for a long time, I wasn't really sure. Um, but I know that um, by the time I was about 13 or 14, there was a series on TV um, called The Face of Tutankhamun with Christopher Frayling. And I know that my mum videoed that and we all sat down every week. It was a four part series, BBC Two, in the week, uh, sort of eight o'clock, nine o'clock. We all sat down and watched that really religiously every week and were really hooked. It was really exciting that that was on. So I was definitely already hooked by that time. Um, but I'm, at the time I was going to university, I, uh, I was just about realising that I probably wasn't going to be good enough to play for Arsenal. And um, so I, really what I wanted to do more than anything else was be in Radiohead. Uh, yeah. I went to university because I thought archaeology would be interesting. Um, uh, and to be honest, actually, it's when, it's when I went to university that I suddenly realised, oh, OK, right, this is, this, is what I, this is what I want to do. And of all the things... Uh, all the different specialisms that were available to me there, Egyptology seemed to be the one. Um, and um, ever since then, I've been working on the basis that I'll carry on doing this and, until, uh, you know, I, I need to go and get a proper job. And um, so far, I haven't had to, which has been great. Um, but I sort of always, I sort of always feel like, you know, my luck's going to run out <laughs> at some point. Have you been to uh, have a look in the gem yet? I've not actually been in. Um, I, I've been to the site um, and I've seen the building going up. Um, I've been to the labs, I've been to the conservation labs a number of times. Um, but no, I've, I've not. I was at a conference in November last year where they had a sort of special tour for participants. Unfortunately, I had to fly to Sudan that day. So, uh, so I missed out. Um, 
and yeah, I mean, from what I'm seeing, uh, it, 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 I mean, it's now, it's not finished, but it, it's getting close. There's it really is a building. Look amazing. I think like, yeah. there seems to be a real resurgence in interest in ancient Egypt and the general. Uh, it's going to, yeah. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be gargantuan. As There's soon as, as of, soon as people can go there, you're right. I mean, there'll be loads of people. Um, there's a couple of really good questions here from Dotty. Um, he asks, um, you mentioned Happy, and is he a transgender god? I always thought he just had moobs, or is he like part female, half male, because he used the fertility of the Nile? And that the... is a good question. I believe that Happy is male. Um, his appearance is, you're absolutely right, um, as a very fecund um, I think is probably the right word, um, God, and that, and so he has sort of rolls of fat and and moves. Yeah, good word, um, and that is intended to symbolise um, a sort of abundance of life. So what the Egyptians wanted was for the Nile to be fu full, if you like, full of uh, of, of, of life giving forces. So, so he's personified as this very full, fat, essentially individual, and that's um that's not entirely uncommon in Egyptian iconography. Um, people who have succeeded in life often were depicted as fat, sort of rolls of fat and large breasts, large-breasted individuals. Um, the idea being that if 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 you were you know if you were fat, it was a sign that you were wealthy enough to overfeed yourself. Um, which was much better than not having the uh, enough money. But what, didn't you also have the opposite, where you had fat, unhealthy pharaohs and um, figures of authority being represented as like slim and perfect versions of themselves? Um, I, I, there, there's a Ptolemaic pharaoh whose uh, sort of nickname was Fatty, which is when that was intended to be... Um, um, uh, you know a, a, a way of poking fun at him um and you're right also that that so there's a very good example in a tomb 25th dynasty tomb in luxor where there are two um depictions of the deceased individual being led in, in sort of procession if you like so there's one here and one here both going in the same direction towards the west towards the afterlife um and this this there's a sort of sequence to them in the first one, uh, the deceased is shown being led by the hand by the god Anubis, at, just as we saw in the Book of Thoth, in the in the uh, in the lecture, um, being led forward. And in the first image, he's fat with drooping breasts and a sort of sagging paunch. And the idea is that at that point, he's still in his earthly form. He's still okay. alive, if you like, or he's recently deceased. So he's reached old age and is successful and rich. What happens in between the two is that there's a series of spells um, and texts relating to mummification and rejuvenation. And then when you see him in the next scene with Anubis, he, it's the, essentially the scene repeats, Anubis leading him by the hand. But in, in this case, the drooping breasts and the paunch have gone. He's got like a completely flat stomach. And so that is the, you're absolutely right. That's the ideal vision of youthful, slim um beauty i suppose okay and dotty yeah. asks another really interesting question actually about hermes and uh, the idea of the emerald tablet is this relating to the emerald tab tablet kind of mythology this? that is that's a bit outside my knowledge i'm afraid dotty sorry um can you explain well the 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 sort of w the wisdom um i suppose you know the tablet of wisdom of thoth is supposed to be on this emerald tablet it's a kind of legendary i don't know i don't know how new age it is or whether it's a conspiracy theory type of thing but what you were saying is basically exactly what the emerald tablet legend ah okay so uh, so this is a little bit outside my sphere of expertise it sounds to me as though that uh, that is a part of the story of the Corpus Hermeticum, mm. um, which is a bit which is a bit beyond um, your average Egyptologist, uh, actually. Um, 
the texts are written in Greek. Um, they were written in the sort of later period in Egyptian history in Egypt, no doubt, quite possibly deriving from older Egyptian texts that we don't that don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they they come down to us in even later forms, and um, I'm sure that you know they come to be associated with things like alchemy. Yeah. Um, I know, I only really know this sort of secondhand. I don't know it terribly well. Thoth is supposed to be like the the foundation stone, if you like. And I don't know whether, I think I read somewhere that it was supposed to be inscribed on Moldavite or something like that. Uh, like a meteorite, a, a stone caused by a meteorite. Could be, could be. There's a, re I think the best thing I can do is to say that in that page of notes that I, I put up on my website, there's a reference to um, the edition of the Corpus Hermeticum where I took the quotes from, which is the ebook is not very expensive, sort of less than 20 quid. Um, there's a great intro to the whole thing in there. Um, so I know about those, I know, I know about those texts a little bit from various ways, but I first came across them actually because of that reference to the location of the tomb of mm -hmm. Um But, the, but there's, a, there's a lot in there. You may, you may, find, you may find that answers the question, I hope. I'm sorry I couldn't do that myself sorry Dottie. how do you feel question. about the kind of ancient aliens aspect of things and the and the various kind of you know dotty was mentioning the the talk of the atlantean hall of records underneath the sphinx's paw and i've been my uh, boyfriend subscribed to gaia tv and there's like non-stop amazing good programs about ancient alien astronaut theorists on there which i i do really enjoy um because they're quite exciting but um what how do you feel with because this stuff's becoming quite popular now and common in yes TV. yeah i mean we you know we um i mean i'm sort of with you on the a little bit of me is with you on the you know the, the sort of excitement of it but we everything that we are egyptologists um look at how sticks has to stick sort of rigidly to the evidence so um and and there are huge gaps in the evidence as well so for example we don't know how the pyramids were built we just don't um and that leads to lots of speculation and um pe people often ask me you know so how what do you think how do you think they were built and the honest sort of academic answer which is probably not very satisfactory for anybody is we just don't know um but you know here are some theories and ultimately we we have to assume in the absence of any good proof for there being any other way that it was basically a lot of guys and a lot of ropes um that you know but the door is open this is where all those sorts of other ideas come from because we just can't we just can't say for sure so of course for anybody who just can't believe that a lot of guys and a lot of ropes could move those huge things you know you have to then start asking well what other explanations might there be and I the, mean, obviously yeah exactly um and you know us egyptologists uh, you know I, I think we all sort of feel as though all we can really do is say well look here's the evidence we've got um and you know this is what we can say on the basis of that but we have to accept that you know we don't know but don't is know. the documentation that Khufu, that was a tomb for Khufu, because that's one of the things that the ancient alien astronaut theorists say a lot, is that there's no yeah. evidence showing that that was a tomb for Khufu. Yeah, so um, the evidence is not good enough for those for people who want to uh, see it as something else. Um, so people say, how do we know pyramids were tombs? No mummies have ever been found in them. How do we know? Um, uh, and how do we know how do we know the great pyramid was built by khufu and you know you, you've got to accept that yeah okay look the evidence is not um c comprehensive and complete you might say um in a if you if you imagine you know trying to judge something like this in a court of law this is how i would look at it the case would collapse there'd be no there'd be no case you wouldn't be able to reach a verdict because there's insufficient evidence either way so there'd be no trial the trial would collapse but archaeology is not like that, you know, in ancient history is not like that. You need some kind of conclusion. So, so what, what people, somebody like me would say is that, okay, look, in, on the question of whether or not they're tombs, there is uh, 
a clear a clear sort of typology of tomb types um which begins with pit graves tumuli moves to mastabas mastabas evolve into pyramids and in the great pyramid you so the great pyramid is part of that evolution of of what are clearly tombs and even if you say well we never found a mummy in a pyramid there have been plenty of mummies found in others of those tombs we, and the pyramids are part of that sequence there's also something in the uh, the central chamber i'm being careful not to give it its normal name the central chamber in the great pyramid which looks really like a sarcophagus and it's placed at one end you know all of those things make it look really like a sarcophagus um one of the blocks inside the pyramid is inscribed with the name of khufu only one which is maybe not as many as you might expect but still it's there um there is a tomb which is adjacent to the pyramid which is again it's clearly a tomb and it contains the human remains of a deceased person and a whole ton of grave goods and those belong to the mother of khufu and it's a, it's in association with the great pyramid which is the sort of place you'd expect for a relation of the person buried in the main thing there are loads of officials of khufu loads of references to the pyramid of khufu um in uh in text and in titles um in in other words i could go on and on mm. i think um, there's scope for like a tv show that's like a sort of judge judy ancient alien astronaut theorist and egyptologist just battling it out maybe with those big like spongy things they used to have in gladiators <laughs> uh, it's a shame you don't get like the two people talking to one another yeah yeah i yeah well i mean i i certainly some of my colleagues you know just won't engage at all with these kinds of things and i always kind of think that if you if you don't engage then um you know or, or the door is open for all kinds of uh ideas some of which might be actually not so crazy and some of them might be you know really crazy um and it, it's up to us um without being too snobbish or skeptical or cynical or you know anything like that to just say well look here's what we really know and you know it's up to you what conclusions you draw but but you know these are the conclusions that we draw and we think that that's quite rational mm. um but that you know all of those come with a heavy dose of i don't know and um yeah I, I, yeah i mean i think i think we'd come across as being very boring by comparison in a kind of <laughs> <laughs> you all, you just you need like. a bit more lens flare then you'll be all right <laughs> yeah, really maybe. loud background music yes um, maybe. Where, what, what do you just very quickly before we wrap up where do you think um other influencing factors came from for ancient egyptian civilization like where where did this kind of great culture arise from um well for for a long time it was um it was thought that it could not possibly have um arisen in the nile valley um you know and that it had to have been imported from somewhere else uh and that's partly because um there was a time when our knowledge of the beginnings of ancient egyptian civilization were were such that it appeared as though the Egyptian state appeared kind of fully formed at a certain point in time and it had no sort of development. We now understand what we call the pre-dynastic, so the period of history prior to the first king of the first dynasty. We now understand that much, much better than we used to. Um, and so we can now begin to see a bit more clearly the development of the key signifiers of Egyptian civilization, like um, religious beliefs, um, cult worship, um, the system of writing, um, styles of architecture, um, artistic motifs. Um, there is still, I think, a good amount of evidence to suggest that there was an influence from the Near East. Um, a Mesopotamian or Syria. Yes, exactly, yes. Um, where city-states, a system of writing, um, begins to develop in places like Jericho on a similar sort of timeline. Um, but I don't think i think now while while we can accept that there was 
you know, there were influences from elsewhere. By and large, um, a lot of a lot of those, you know, key signifiers of what would become Egyptian culture arose spontaneously over a very long period of time. Um, it among different peoples and in, in slightly different places, but within the Egyptian Nile Valley and Delta, and um, those different groups of people eventually came to settle in the Nile Valley and the Delta and coalesced under a single ruler at the beginning of the first dynasty. And so, um, yeah, I think that if that's not too vague an answer, that I think now is probably the consensus view is that there probably was an influence from outside, but you know, we needn't assume that you know everything began fully formed somewhere else and then was brought in. And I guess like the civilization of Kush as well was actually quite influential in the early days as well and there seemed to be a lot of parallels with their cultural development. Yes yeah that is a yeah it's a yeah it is an interesting feature actually that um the uh one of the earliest cultures we're aware of from the Nile Valley south of Egypt in what is now um well, the very southernmost part of Egypt and then into Sudan, um, a culture called the A group. We don't know what their own name for themselves was, if they had one. Um, that that culture reached m it, far further north into Egypt um, than, than was initially realised. So there was much more overlap. Um, and it was perhaps just a feature of the development of the Egyptian state that eventually there was a boundary established at a certain point, a frontier, and those cultures from further south were banished or driven south. Um, and there's a there's a there's a point where the the cultures in Egypt came to be sort of homogenized and different from what was to the south. But prior to that point. And the establishment of a clear frontier and a state, you've got a lot more mixing and mingling. And there's no question that I think that that was happening within Egypt as well. So one of the reasons why Egyptian mythology can be so complicated um, is that it, it, the way it survives down to us is what survives down to us is probably a mixture of lots of different local traditions. Mm -hmm. So you know there might have been a let's say a, a ibis-headed god in various different places, but with different names and different stories attaching to them. And eventually they all sort of become uh, Thoth, but somehow those different stories all survive. So the there myth of Thoth from here is different yeah. from the myth of Thoth here, you know. There seems to be a recognition of that even in ancient Egypt of, the, like for example, the trinities that were a big part of their religious system the trinities had the same function and then you even go on to have the trinity in christianity as well it seems to be like uh, a recurring motif for religious belief systems yeah 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 um yes and there are a number of different um a lot a lot of those trinities or sometimes sometimes there are groups of gods um of different numbers as well um they they often sort of trace their origins back to the sort of creation of the world um and that that means that we've ended up with a whole different series of conflicting stories about how the world was created all apparently you know the definitive version of egyptian um concept of the creation of the universe um yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. Jason, just to end on, Jason asked, are you planning to do any further talks about pre-dynastic Egypt? Uh, if I'm really honest, not at the moment, um, but um, uh, it, it's something that I hope to get to at some point. Um, I, I've um, In the next few months, I'm going to be promoting... Um, my notebooks uh, book i've got some lectures to do on tutankhamun um i've got a children's book on cleopatra to finish um i'm not sure if i'm supposed to say that yet but um i am um so i i, I at the moment i don't i don't have a good excuse to go uh, and look at the pre dynastic but i i do hope to be able to do that because it's something that interests me and i know it, i know it's something that interests a lot of people as well and um uh, with something that I'm sort of toying with is doing a, is running a general introduction to ancient Egypt type course, and that that would involve you know where does it all come from and how oh, does it that'd all be great.
because um, I, I really want to sign up for the Bloomsbury Summer School. Do you know much about the Bloomsbury? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, yes, that that is in swing at the moment. I think, although yeah, dramatically on. changed, I um, think. Because I missed a question earlier. Colin asked, "Can you visit the animal catacombs?" A good, a good question. You can visit the Serapium. You can visit the Greater Vaults in the Serapium. Um, and they are the most spectacular, actually. So uh, they are well worth visiting. They were closed for many years because the uh, the tunnels were unstable, but they've all been um, secured now. So there's an awful lot of sort of huge iron arches supporting the roof and everything. But you, yeah, you can go and see them. Um, unfortunately, and I have tried this often in the last few years with groups, um, they just will not allow you to walk across the uh, the desert north of the step pyramid it's just they it's just they don't like you to do it so um yeah the serapium is all you can see but as i say i mean it's the best there's the best bit so well worth going to see brilliant well i'll let you um get on with your domestic duties now um, thank you again <laughs> so much and please come back and do something else as well because i, can I about sure i'd love to forever and a day so that was absolutely amazing and thank you everyone for coming along as well i really appreciate it and i'm yes, gonna um upload this onto youtube now as well chris so um Great. share with those people that weren't able to join but yeah Great. thank you so much really appreciate it, it was absolutely Fantastic. brilliant thank you for the invite thanks for coming everyone bye bye